this kind of service this morning yeah. on Friday when I heard the Lord the Lord spoke to me on what he wanted me to preach this Sunday and it just unfolded to me on Friday this whole thing about the cross and I think it's so fitting to share this message it squarely relates to all that has been said here this morning and so I want to say to you be careful how you hear this word this morning you see, God knew that you were going to be in the service. Amen. And he gave me this message to release to you and I this morning. Amen. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we give you praise. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who sees the end from the beginning. You know all things. You know exactly what we need, even before we know. Mighty God, you are the God of divine prearrangements. Hallelujah. You put arrangements in place ahead of time Amen. to get us from where we are yes, to where we need to be. Mighty God, we thank you for what you have already begun to do in this service. And Lord, I pray that as this word goes forth to be, it will go forth with power, with might, with accuracy, I pray that you will pierce hearts this morning. I pray, Lord, that you will encourage those who feel discouraged and downcast even now. And Lord, we are careful always to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' mighty name. And the church say, Amen. Before you take your seats this morning, I sense such a strong anointing, a strong presence of the Lord here. And I know that even as we minister this word, supernatural things are going to happen. Some of you are going to be healed. Some of you are going to be set free. Demonic bondages and chains will be broken off of your life. Scales are going to come off your eyes. You're going to see things that you didn't see before because the word of God is here. The Son of God is here. The Holy Spirit is here. In the mighty name of Jesus. This morning we are in the gospel according to Luke. We are reading three verses from this gospel. Luke chapter 9. Reading from verse 23 to 25. Luke 9. 23 to 25. You can follow in your Bibles as we read all found? Amen. It says, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? May the Lord bless the reading of his word to our hearing this morning. You may have your seats. And for all of us gathered here this morning, we're speaking on the subject learning to embrace your cross. Learning to embrace your cross. Have you ever made a commitment or a recommitment to follow the Lord and put Him first in your life only to find that life gets harder instead of easier? And often our expectation is that God would bless us, make our lives easier when we give Him more worship and praise and you know more service and while this happens sometimes that's not always the case 
Sometimes a commitment to greater faith in Jesus leads to suffering and persecution. And this was the case for a gentleman by the name of Nok Seng. Nok Seng. He was the first Christian convert from a community in Meghalaya, India. This is a true story. And according to P. Job, when Noxeng's tribe found that he was a follower of Jesus Christ, the village chief threatened to harm him if he didn't renounce his faith. And Noxeng responded by declaring, I have decided to follow Jesus. Amen. Following the execution of his children, he continued, Although no one joins me, still I will follow Jesus. Well, this led to the execution of his wife. Finally, before his own death, nursing son, the world behind me, the cross before me, the unshakable faith of this brand new Christian in the face of persecution, it led to the conversion of the chief, the same chief that presided over the death of his family. And so this experience became the foundation of that hymn. I'm sure we all know it. I've decided to follow Jesus. This is the story that gave birth to that song. I have decided to follow Jesus. What about you? Who are you following? And what is it costing you to follow that which you are following? If it's not costing you anything, then what's the point of following? Jesus said, to follow me, it will cost you something. And so he says, count the cost before you decide to follow me. It's going to cost something to follow Jesus. You say, what does it cost to follow Jesus? Well, I'm glad you asked. The answer is found in the very first point of this sermon this morning. And it's this. Each of us needs to recognize that in this life, we will have a cross to bear. I want to repeat that. Each of us will have a cross to bear in this life. The cross to follow Jesus involves carrying a cross. In the opening verse of the text, Jesus says, Anyone who desires to follow me will have to take up their cross each and every day and follow me. Now let's talk about carrying a cross. It may, it may not seem strange to us because it has now become a common expression in, you know, in Christian circles. But we need to remember that back then the disciples had never heard this expression before. In fact, they were now hearing for the first time, how the Lord was going to die. So to use the expression, take up your cross and follow me as a call to action must have seemed like a very strange manner of speech. Because this is equivalent to someone in our time saying, take up your noose and follow me. That's how we kill people. That's how we uh, um, execute capital punishment, right? By the hangman. So it's like Jesus was saying, take up your noose and follow me. That is in effect what he was saying to his hearers. No doubt it was a shocking statement. Because anyone who was executed on a cross was considered to be a national disgrace that was the mechanism that Rome used to punish the vilest of criminals 
to let them know that Rome is all powerful and almighty. Death on the cross is one of the worst forms of capital punishment. And yet, Jesus is saying, take up your cross and follow me. Now, Jesus wasn't trying to be clever. He wasn't trying to come up with some catchphrase that, you know, people can remember. No, Jesus was using this expression because he expected it to be obeyed. Each of us will have a cross to carry in this life. And I find it interesting that of the three gospel writers that talked about this incident, only Luke added the word daily. You see, as disciples, we are called to follow Jesus. It's not a one-time call. It is moment by moment, day by day, we are told to follow Jesus. We cannot afford, not for one moment, to take our eyes off of Jesus. We have to follow Him daily. So there is no place for self-interest. Instead, we as the people of God, we must be willing to suffer and deny ourselves every day. This is what Jesus did. But if we are to take up our cross daily, what does Jesus mean by this word cross? Is it that Jesus expected us to literally go in the forest, cut down a tree and carry a cross on our back? Is that what Jesus meant? Obviously the answer to that is no. The cross is a symbol of capital punishment that is uniquely linked to Jesus and Jesus alone. So when Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, he's saying, because of your association, your identification with me, you too will have to take up a burden to follow me. It is going to cost you something to follow Jesus. Make no mistake about it, friends. We are not here to, you know, come and tell you about your best life now and seven steps and all this kind of thing. It is going to cost us something. But I want you to stay with me. You see, people who were crucified on a cross, they had to literally take that pole, carry it on their shoulders. I mean, this is to tell you the extent of the power of Rome to crush the criminal mindset and psyche. You carry a cross and then I'm going to crucify you on it. Could you imagine that? And the cross wasn't some matchstick or some, some pizza. This, this thing was a heavy pizza, a, a, a pole that sometimes people will die trying to carry the cross. Cross was heavy. So it was no easy feat to carry a cross. Even Jesus, as you would recall, struggled to carry his cross. In fact, somebody had to help Jesus carry his cross. Remember that? Jesus was so beaten and battered and bruised from the scourging that he got. He lost so much blood. He could hardly stand up. Yet, he had to carry this cross up this hill. Up this hill, imagine that, toting a cross up a hill. He fell down so many times. Sometimes we too will struggle with our cross. Sometimes you will fall down. Sometimes you will want to give up, throw in the towel. Why me? Why are I carry this heavy thing? Lord, that is fair. You see, the cross that Jesus was talking about wasn't just a physical cross. It was more than that. In fact, Jesus defined for us the full scope of his cross 
in the preceding verse to our text, in Luke 9, 22, listen to what he says. He says, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. So what is your cross? What is this cross, you ask? The cross is the specific adversity that you were divinely ordained to bear because of your association with Christ. Each of us will have to face some type of trial, some type of testing, some type of adversity in this life. That's why Paul says, all those who desire to live godly shall suffer persecution. There's some things that we have to go through the songwriter says, some through the what? Water. Some through the water. Some through the flood. Some through great fires. Sometimes they feel they're going through a fire. And then he says, all through the blood. Because the blood is still efficacious. The blood has lost its power to deliver and set you free. One of the things you need to recognize is that each person's cross is unique to their calling and purpose in Christ. Your cross is not the same as my cross. My cross is not the same as your cross. Because I may not be able to bear the weight of your cross. You may not be able to bear the weight of my cross. Your cross is customized to suit you. And, and your situation. Remember what the word of God says? In 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. Let's put up that verse. The apostle Paul, he says, There has no temptation, no trial, no cross that has overtaken you. That is not common to man. But what? What God is going to do? He says, God is able. God is able. That you will not be, you know, he, he will not be crushed under the weight of the, the cross. He says he will not allow you to be tested above that which you are able to bear. But he says he will make a way of escape. So understand that the cross wasn't given to crush you. The cross wasn't given to defeat you. The cross is there to develop you. You are going to face some trials in this life. And I want to I want us to look at one of the servants of Almighty God to understand the cross that he had to carry. In Acts chapter 9, Saul had been transformed to Paul on the Damascus road. When the Lord encountered him, he saw this bright light. He was knocked off of his horse, knocked to the ground. The Lord spoke to him, he says, Paul, it is hard for you to kick against the goals. He says, who are you, Lord? He says, I am Jesus. The one, one that you are persecuted. Why are you persecuting me, Paul? See, sometimes you can be sincere, but sincerely wrong. And so Paul underwent a transformation. He was transformed from Saul, the murderer, the killer, the persecutor, to Paul, the apostle, sent to the Gentiles. A mighty apostle. But, but Paul was left blinded for a season. He did not he could not see because of the bright light. And so in a vision, the Lord appeared to one of his servants, a fellow by the name of Ananias. And in the vision, the voice of the Lord spoke to Ananias and says, Go to the street called Straight. There's a fellow there called Paul. 
who used to be named Saul. He prayed, go and lay hands on him so that he can receive his sight. And Ananias protested. And Ananias said, but Lord, you're serious. This man is the this man is the um, the Bin Laden of our society. This man is a criminal. This man going after Christians and persecuting them and throwing them in jail and all kind of things. Lord, surely you can't be you can't be serious. You see, Paul had a reputation that preceded him. And in one of these scriptures, I think it said about Paul, he was breathing out venom. I mean, that can tell you how you know how how passionate Paul was about his cause. He was totally consumed in persecuted Christians because he thought that is what you know that is what the Lord had required of him. And so when Ananias protested, the Lord would have none of it. And, and listen to what the Lord said. The Lord silenced Ananias. Listen to what he said about Paul and the cross that Paul had to carry. In Acts 9, 15 and 16, the Lord said to him, Go! I'm not going to entertain any excuses. Go! For he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles kings and the children of Israel. Listen to the last statement. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. What an awesome revelation. God said, I have to show him the cross that he has to carry for my name's sake. So we need to understand what our cross represents. Our cross is not some form of punishment for sin or rebellion. That's not your cross. That's not your cross. Your cross is the unique adversity that you have to suffer daily because of your association with Christ. All of us have a cross to carry. Your, your cross may come in the form of some kind of mistreatment, rejection, alienation, some kind of setback, some circumstance in your life. You know, Paul had a thorn in the flesh. And you know what I find interesting about the cross? Is that the people who are Sometimes putting that cross on you, putting that cross on you to carry. Many times they don't know what they're doing. They don't even know why they persecuted you. They don't know why they put in obstacles in your path. They don't know why they put in the knife in your back. They don't know. Remember what Jesus said as he hung lifeless on the cross? Remember what was Jesus' last words? What did he say? He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They don't know what they're doing. Even the martyr, the first martyr, Stephen, pelting him to death. Imagine that a whole gang of them picking up big stone. There's not no pebbles, eh? Big stone they're picking up. Pelting Stephen. And as Stephen is about to give up the ghost, what did he say? Father, forgive them. Do they this to their charge? Because they don't know what they're doing. And I want to say to you this morning that the people responsible for laying the cross on your shoulder, those people who act like a thorn in your side, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know that they're being used as a divine instrument to be the cross that you have to take up daily. Once you recognize this fact, once you understand that there is a higher purpose for this cross, it's going to change your perspective on adversity. This leads me to the second point I want to make this morning, and it's this. Instead of resisting the cross, learn to embrace it. I want to repeat that. I know the cross is hard. 
the cross is difficult. The songwriter says that old rugged cross, sometimes just having that cross on your back will cut you because it's rugged, it's rough, it's hard, it's heavy. But don't resist it. Don't resist the cross. Learn to embrace it. You say, why? Why should I want to embrace something so difficult, something so hard, something so painful and excruciating? Why should I want to embrace that? Firstly, this is exactly what Jesus did. What does the scripture say? He went like a what? A lamb to the slaughter. No complaints. When they were accusing him, vehemently accusing him, what did the Bible say? He said, not a word. Because he embraced the cross. And in the build up to a text, Jesus put a question to his disciples. He says, who do you say that I am? In response, Peter said, You are the Christ of God. You are the Messiah. And we know the incident. Jesus said, Son, uh, Simon, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And from that moment, Jesus began to explain to his disciples the concept of the cross. He went on to tell them the many things he had to suffer. That he would be rejected and ostracized and this would lead to his death. When Peter heard this, what did Peter do? He began, imagine Peter, Lord, this will never happen to you. He began to upbraid Jesus, rebuke Jesus. But Jesus would have none of it. And in Matthew's version of the story, Jesus turned to Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And at first glance, we would think, Why is Jesus being so harsh? Is he implying that Peter was demonized? Notice he didn't address Peter. He says, Get behind me, Satan. No. Jesus recognized that the words coming out of Peter's mouth wasn't his own words. But they were words inspired by those injected into Peter's thoughts by the devil. Something you need to recognize is that not all the thoughts in your mind belong to you. Let me repeat that. Not all the thoughts that you are entertaining in your mind originate with you. You see, we have a wicked devil. The Bible talks about the fiery darts. That's why you have to put on the what? The helmet of salvation. To guard against those fiery darts. Sometimes he injects thoughts into our minds, telling you you are no good, telling you you are nobody, telling you that God don't care about you, telling you look at look at this God, this God who say he love you. Imagine he got this big cross he put on your back, and then telling you he wanna carry a cross. How could that God love you? That's what Satan is coming to. He is the accuser of the brethren. He comes to sow discord. And, and so he whispers in your ears all oh, kind of contrary thing. Yes. You have to make sure you know sign for that. Yes. What does the Bible say? We, we need to what? Pull out every thought, every imagination that what? Exalts itself against the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Pull it down! And dismantle those thoughts and every high thing. That's what the enemy comes. Whisper in your ear. Telling you all kind of contrary thing. Trying to sell your cat in basket, as we would say. Eh? Or cat in bag. That's what you're trying to do. You wanna be you wanna be discerning. Be discerning. The Bible says, do not be ignorant of the what? The devices of the enemy. 
becomes to you know distort and corrupt our thinking. You see the battlefield is in the mind. That's where the battle takes place. That is where the battle is raging. The enemy is trying to gain the ascendancy in our mind, in our thoughts. He wants to, to, to make you feel that you are inferior. He wants to say, but this God, he's so unfair. Why do you want to carry this cross? And look at your neighbor, they cross taller than yours. He's unfair. That's the kind of thing the enemy will be whispering in his ears. So but why, why, why he gave you that big cross and he gave everybody else a small one? Eh? Yes, he is a set of God. Yes, he will like you. We have to be mindful of the devices of the enemy. Your cross and my cross is not the same. I'm sure when Jesus rebuked Peter, Jesus was saying, in essence, Peter, Stop resisting your cross. Learn to embrace it. This is what I have been modeling before you. And this is how Jesus put it in John 12, 27. John 12, 27. He says, No, my soul is troubled. Sometimes, yes, because you're carrying a cross, your soul will be troubled. Sometimes you won't be able to sleep. Sometimes you'll be disturbed. But listen to what Jesus says. He says, what shall I say? Shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? But this, for this purpose, I came to this hour. In other words, he recognized. This is why I came. To carry this cross. That's why I'm here. So Jesus recognized that resisting the cross was futile. He had to bear it. Because we know that the Lamb of God was saying when? From the foundation of the world. So from the beginning of time, Jesus was ordained to carry that cross. And so if that was the case, if that is the case, we are ordained to carry a cross, then why resist it? If you are ordained to carry a cross, to be identified with Christ, why resist it? Resistance is futile. Resistance shows a lack of understanding, a lack of maturity. This is what we see demonstrated in the life of Peter. He lacked understanding and because of that he talked out of turn. And so Jesus had to redirect Peter. And that's what he's doing with us this morning. He is redirecting us. There's a redirection taking place. He says, stop resisting your cross. Learn to embrace it. Because that cross is not going to destroy you. Somebody needs to know that. The Bible says, the God that we serve, there's no variableness. There's no shadow of turning in him. He is a good God. He is a gracious God. Amen. He is mighty to say. He's not a wicked God. He's not a two-tongued God telling you one thing and doing something else. No, he's a God of integrity. So you need to know that that cross was not given to destroy you. That cross was given to develop you. That's why we need to make a shift. We need to shift from resisting to embracing the cross. This leads me to the third and final point this morning. And it's this. Embracing your cross enables you to seek your eternal life. I said, when you embrace your cross, you are securing your eternal life. This is what Jesus said in verse 24 of the text. He says, whoever desires to save his life will what? Lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. What does Jesus mean by this? This statement is the whole point 
of his command to take up your cross. This is Jesus saying the reason why I'm asking you to take up your cross is not to show off. It is not to appear pious and holy. No. The reason I'm asking you to do this is because it's going to be down to your very edge. It's going to produce a different kind of life in you. A life that flushes up, that burns up. The life of the Spirit. It's called abundant life. And so this statement by Jesus becomes both a warning and a promise. Jesus is saying, we have to embrace pain as the pathway to ultimate prosperity. That's why, you know, Jesus says, except a grain of wheat, what? Falls to the ground and what? Dies. It cannot reproduce. You never ask how many people want to go to heaven. Everybody gonna pop their hand. <laughs> but how are you gonna get to heaven? How are you thinking in there? You have to pass through the door of death. You have to die to go to heaven. But that's provided the rapture doesn't take place first. But the majority of people will have to go through the door of death. Death is painful. Death is sorrowful. But you see, we need to change our perspective on death. Death is but a door for the born again believer. When you die, you are just crossing a door. What did Jesus say? He said, The God that we serve, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, He's not the God of the dead. These fellas that we're talking about, they are not dead as you spoke. He's the God of life. And that more abundantly. Death is but a door. It's a new realm. For the believer to be absent in the body is to what? Be present with the Lord. That's why Paul says, Oh, death, where's your sting? Oh, grave, where's your victory? You must be swallowed up in victory. Swallowed up. Swallowed up. So sometimes we may have to suffer a while. Sometimes we have to carry a cross. But it's not the end. In the Greek, there's some powerful things I want you to see here. In the Greek, verse 24 actually reads like this. Whoever wills to save his life will lose it. And whoever wills to lose his life will save it. The key word here is will. So what Jesus is saying, this issue of taking up your cross... This issue of following me, it has far-reaching consequences. Consequences of life and death. And what I'm putting to you is all centered in your will. In other words, when all is said and done, it comes down to your choices. In other words, what Jesus is saying, I'm putting before you a choice. A choice. A choice. Amen. Taking up your cross and following me is a choice. Jesus is saying you're going to have to choose. What did Joshua say? He says, as for me and my house, we have what made a choice to serve the Lord. It all comes down to choice. Choice. And so I ask you the question. Will you give up your life, your relationships, your conceptions, your ties to this world in order to follow Jesus? Is there anything that you will not give up to follow Jesus? My mind reflects on the 
the, the man, man who found the treasure in the field, hidden in a field. He found this treasure and to his surprise, he couldn't believe it. He went back and he hid the field, hid the treasure. And it says he went and sold all that he had to purchase that field. You see, when you recognize the treasure that is in this earthen vessel, everything else pales in. When you recognize you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, it's like you won't see anything else here. All you can see is Christ. All you see is Christ. And so the question before us is what choice are you going to make? You see, no choice is also a choice. No choice is a choice. If you don't make a choice to serve Christ, you made a choice. You are going to make a choice one way or the other. And so you have to be intentional, deliberate. Jesus says nobody's going to stumble into heaven. He says there's a straight, there's a straight path. And you have to find it. You have to be intentional. You're not going to stumble into it. You have to find it. You have to make a choice. That's what Jesus was putting before his disciples. You have to make a choice to follow me. And if you make a choice to follow me, you're going to have to take up a cross. There are trials you're going to have to face in this life. There are setbacks you will have to face in this life. But you see, this life is not our whole life. This life, as we would say, is a drop in the bucket. And so what Jesus is saying, this choice, you're not going to put all your eggs in this basket. No, you have to put some of your eggs in the basket of life to come. That's why you're going to have to make a choice to take up your cross. Because they see that same cross, while it may be heavy and burdensome, that cross is like a bridge. That's what that cross is. That cross that you take up, it is a bridge that is going to lead you from this life to the next life. So you understand now, if you want to take up your cross, what going on with you? You can't go from this life to that life. Because your cross is a bridge to eternal life. That's what the cross represents. It is a bridge. And so I'm saying to you, are you going to take up your cross? Jesus said in Matthew 10 to the 8, He says, He who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. That's what Jesus said. You see how powerful this concept of the cross is? If you don't take up your cross, Jesus says you are not worthy. You, I am going to disown you. So as I conclude this morning, I want to remind you that your choice to follow Jesus isn't a life of shortcuts. It isn't a pain-free life that promises your best life now. I know you have a lot of people telling you about your best life now and all of that stuff. But we are here to declare the gospel of God, the unadulterated gospel of God. In fact, many times quite the opposite is true. You examine the men and women of God, the heroes of faith. In Hebrews 11, Many of them did not receive the promise. And God says they could not receive it because they could not be perfected because of us. That's why James says, Count it all joy. When, not if, when you fall into various trials. In other words, James is saying, Don't oh, give up, don't despair. That is temporal. We can endure for a night, but what joy comes in the morning is temporal. It's 
a test and test come to pass <laughs> it's a test this too will pass Jesus counted all joy knowing that the testing of your faith will produce patience he goes on to say let patience have it perfect work so that you will be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. That's what James says. And this is the point of taking up your cross. When you take up that cross, it enables you to tap into a life where there is nothing lacking. You see, the true treasure of life does not consist in the abundance of things that we possess. That's why Jesus says, in the last verse of our text, He says, What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his one soul? The true meaning of life then isn't found in material possessions, but it's found in relationship with Christ. Because he who has the Son has what? Life. Has the life. He who does not have the Son does not have the life. In fact, without the Son, you are dead while you live. You are living dead without the Son. So what then is the solution to this predicament? In the words of Jesus, take up your cross daily and follow me. Don't resist, but learn to embrace your cross. And as you do, you will discover that although the cross may become difficult to carry, you realize that you didn't have to carry it at all. You say, how come? Because you see, Jesus has been with you all along. You know what he said? Remember we said that Jesus struggled to carry his own cross and somebody had to help him? So why do you Jesus is there? He is the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He comes not only to carry your cross, but get this, he comes to carry you. Let's bow our heads and pray. Mighty God, we give you praise. We give you honor. Could we stand in the presence of the Lord? We exalt your name. We magnify your name. Let there be a high note of praise. Let there be a shout of praise. Let there be a voice of praise this morning. We magnify you, Lord. We glorify your name. We exalt your name. Thank you, Lord, that you are with us. Thank you, Lord, that you are leading us in a triumphant procession. Thank you, Lord, for your grace.
come here, you do the will, you are outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ. You want to commit your life to Him. You want to take up your cross and follow Him. Come to the front. We're going to pray with you and follow you this morning. Do we have anyone in this service? The Spirit of the Lord is speaking to you. You know that you are not where you want to be. Or you may have accepted Jesus in the past, but you grow cold. You want to renew your commitment. You want to take up your cross and follow Him. Come to the front. We're going to pray with you. We're going to pray with you.